you guys. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the state of content management. management. And uh, I kind of had a long version, but I decided to go with a short one since everyone's tired. So if anyone did web development back in 2006, you probably remember that uh, like three major CMSs were like WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla. So if you Google something like this, probably this will happen. So do you know what happens like today? So basically pretty much the same thing. And if you actually Google it, you'll notice that these guys, like CMS critics, are like um, ruining all the fun <laughs> because they obviously took the advantage of the popular cartoon. But uh, 2026, probably the same thing. Now, this has kind of a bad connotation to these three like, pretty cool CMSs. They're not bad, you know, it's just that it's like, wide, widely used. And uh, I'm going to be talking some more about WordPress later, and I'm going to be discussing like, the actual history of the World Wide Web a bit. But allow me a few seconds to introduce myself. So I run a web development company called Orange Hill Development back in Belgrade, Serbia. And I've also started uh, IT Serbia podcast with my colleague Miloš Jekic, and only uh, kind of recently started CMS podcast. Now, the CMS podcast thing is something I've started because I recognize that there's a problem of both developers and agencies, like agency owners, not knowing what CMS options are available for them. So kind of what happens is that the client uh, could possibly receive a product uh, that is not perfectly suitable for them, or that they have paid more than they're supposed to. So if you're kind of comfortable of using only one or two or three CMS systems, you probably um, are good at working with those. But those might not be the best option for the project at hand. So basically, by expanding your knowledge about the CMS world, you're doing a favor to your clients, and they're going to appreciate it. So uh, here's a little story about Orange Hill and what we have did. Um, Apart from working with some amazing clients, our biggest client was actually the biggest company in the world. Uh, perhaps you've heard about it. And two projects that we did were like Burn Residency, uh, like the largest planetary competitions for, for DJs. And the other one was uh, like Nasty Windows of Freedom game that uh, entertain like three major European markets, and both apps like generated some significant numbers, as you can see. And it would be pretty hard to do this if we didn't use Laravel. So big thanks to Laravel and everyone involved in developing such a beautiful framework. And this was uh, back in 2014 when Laravel was in version four. And Coca-Cola being like a really huge name, taking great care about their branding. They have like strict security policies in place. So I'm happy that Laravel was up to the task and passed all the tedious and uh, like really strict tests that um, the company imposed. Also, they have something called like wide list of technologies that you can use for the projects at Coca-Cola. So when we started, they were like, what are you going to use for the project? And I was like, Laravel. And they were like, what's that? And I said, well, it was you know, built upon Symfony Framework. Have you heard about that? Nope. <laughs> and they said, it's a problem. I mean, it's not wide listed. So what do we do? Basically, they've sent me like a sheet that's, I don't know, 10 A4 pages if you print it, and I have to fill it out. And I successfully whitelisted Laravel as a technology, so if anyone works for Coca-Cola, um, I'll clear that out of the way. 
for you. Um, the other thing uh, that we've used is a thing called Photon, CMS, which you probably never heard about. Uh, it's a thing that we're using as an internal tool for like eight years, and it's been evolving ever since. Uh, currently, it's, we're kind of shaping it up to uh, publish it as a probably paid tool by the end of this year. But as a wise man said, don't present incomplete projects. I won't unless you're at the conference to get help. And I do need some help. Uh, I, I'm just going to ask you how many of you used custom CMS for your commercial project, like your own? OK, about fourth of the audience. So it was really hard for me to find any kind of data online, like a survey, survey that um, would let me know the percentages. What do people do when uh, they're, they're building admin panels, like backend interfaces for their applications? So, Mr. Povilas here in the audience. Hi, hey, Povilas, <laughs> not seeing you. <laughs> um, there you are. Hi. Um, created this poll, which gave some results. It was like 100 participants, and uh, basically he did it to kind of be uh, aware of should he proceed in building this uh, nice little tool that you might want to check out. By the way, when you download the slides, everything that's underlined is a link. You can click it. And basically, that's what he found out. And I rerun the same poll in a PHP Serbia Facebook group that had like uh, 57 participants. And if we compare the two, well, actually, let's quickly um, see what, what the questions actually were. So the 43% uh, said that they create their admin panel individually for each and every project. And I thought that's like a terrible waste of time. So imagine that you have to rebuild the admin panel each time you have a new project. That's probably 20 or 30% wasted. So that's going out of the client's pocket. And it's not good. So 12% actually have their own CMS. And 25 are copying or pasting it, sort of like reusing what they've done for the previous project. So they don't have like sort of a product but they reuse their previous, let's say, best practices. And there are 9% that use external package to generate it, and these 11% are, you know, this and that. Probably few users use, like, a third-party CMS to build the admin panel. So in uh, Serbia, things are a bit different. Apparently, uh, guys in Serbia like to build CMSs, so there are 40%, 42% of them that do that, and 28% uh, modifying their previous thing. So we're kind of wasting a little less time, but we're still kind of wasting time. And 11% uh, using external package. So um, how many of you actually use a third-party CMS? So something that someone else did. All right about a little less than, than the, the previous question. And uh, it's pretty strange that people don't use like Laravel-based CMSs, if uh, we uh, kind of assume that most of you are Laravel developers. And uh, there are like some pretty cool options out there. So, I'm just going to briefly mention these few, uh, though there are more. Uh, Pyro CMS has been uh, like in development for quite some time and has only recently been released as a rewritten CMS uh, powered by Laravel. You probably heard of October CMS, uh, only recently hit version 1.0 as well. Statomic is in version 3, and I think, and uh, this last version is built upon Laravel, 
So uh, there's also this Asgard CMS, uh, which sadly I didn't have time to um, test myself, but uh, these, uh, actually two out of those four frameworks I've tested, uh, sorry, um, yeah, and uh, you, if you go to this URL uh, and go under the review se uh, section, you'll be able to see about 10 different uh, CMS reviews that are kind of not uh, tutorials. It's more like how I, as a developer, feel, how I'm feeling about them when I'm using them for the first time. So, obviously, uh, to do any justice to those CMSs, I've uh, read the documentation, top to bottom, and, uh, and then kind of in a one-hour episode, I've used it for the first time, and you know, I uh, commented on my impression. So go to CMS Podcast and uh, look it up. So uh, PHP in general is used by 82.1% of websites. Let me repeat that. 82.1% of the World Wide Web is run by PHP. So that's really an amazing fact. And there are a couple of CMS systems that are built on PHP. You've probably heard of them. Uh, I'm probably not going to talk much about WordPress right now or Joomla. Uh, Joomla is kind of declining in popularity, but uh, there I know that the team is constantly working on improvements, so it's still very much alive. But Drupal. And version 8 has you know, powered up significantly, and that's a tool that you might want to use if you haven't. Though, uh, if you're kind of uh, following the community news, podcasts, and um, that kind of thing, uh, you might be aware that there's like a division, like a separation of Drupal. PHP developers and everyone else, like Drupal developers call themselves Drupalistas and the others make fun of them and vice versa. So um, what's nice here is the craft, the little red dot. So I've, I was so pleasantly surprised when I tested craft, although you know it's not Laravel, uh, like powered by Laravel, it's actually powered by Yee framework. But the structure and the, like, I felt very comfortable using it. So uh, if I may recommend a tool to check right after this presentation, that would be craft. Um, so how many of you have ever used any PHP CMS for your commercial project? So any at all? Well, pretty much everyone. So, um, coming back to WordPress, um, sorry, just a bit, we're kind of stuck, here we go. Um, WordPress itself is used by 26.6% of websites, which is, again, one totally amazing number. So that's 59.5% of CMS market share. And what totally amazes me is this, that CMS, in the CMS world, world, WordPress is the most dreaded tool. Like, nobody likes it, even, I mean, I don't like it, but as an agency owner, I probably like it, because, you know, it builds nice and good-looking websites. You can buy a theme on a... Theme Forest and hook up web websites in two days. Clients happy, I'm happy, everyone's happy. But the developer is probably not that happy. So, um, what can we make of all this information? People online definitely uh, use CMSs. So, like 44.8 of the web use some kind of CMS. So lateral devs tend kind of not to use CMSs. 
WordPress is the most used CMS with 26.6%, and four most used CMSs are PHP-based. WordPress is the most dreaded CMS, and Laravel devs actually use CMS systems at all. I mean, after all. So, um, <laughs> what we actually need is Laravel-based content management that can become as huge and big as any of these three major PHP systems. I believe that's possible. I'm not, going, I'm not sure you know, who's going to do it, but you know, it takes a lot of effort and passion, patience, money, funding, support from the community to build such a tool that will withstand the test of time and uh, the project that are using it. So I hope that within next couple of years, make it even five, we're, we're going to have like a CMS that built on this amazing framework that's um, a, 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 like a go-to tool for us, for all of us to use. Uh, now, a bit about web history. So uh, back in 91, Tim Berners-Lee created uh, the world's first website in CERN, and it took five years to, for the idea to become like a commercial idea, and companies created their first websites. They call it like Web 1.0, though in that time there was no reason to add like versioning number, but now we call it that. And basically it was all static pages with, if you remember, guest books. And if you'd like to communicate to a website owner, you'd go to fill, fill out a form that actually was like a mail to, and it opened up your mail browser and then you uh, submit a mail. And there was basically no interactivity. Um, you can leave a comment, whatever. And it worked pretty fine. And the CMS behind all of that actually did not exist. It was actually a complex tool. You'd have to be an administrator to make a change to a website. Either you'd have to uh, like alter the HTML, or you'd have to, no, there were no databases back then, mostly, so you wouldn't go for a database change. But all in all, regular users were not able to use a CMS to alter or modify their websites. So then in 99, uh, Mr. Darcy Dinucci introduced the term Web 2.0, which didn't took off until 2004 when O'Reilly decided to use that name for their conference. And each year after that, they named, uh, held the conference by the same name. And Web 2.0 is probably the web as we know it. So user participation became a huge thing. So you could comment, you could interact with the website, you could request for a video to be played, you could search through like a bunch of data and get some meaningful results. And there were social networks. I mean, people went crazy about social networks. And CMS 2.0 was pretty much in sync with what Web 2.0 needed. So it was a user-friendly tool that you can, you could, you know, log into your admin panel and then you put on some text and images in your WYSIWYG editor and click save and it worked. And it was actually used by both admins and regular users like with same efficiency. And then in 2009, Web 3.0 got introduced. How, how many have heard about the Web 3.0? Okay, so pretty low number. Um, like, here's this guy, Tim Berners-Lee again, like the father of internet, doing this TED talk about Web 3.0, and the only definition is that it's a semantic web. 
So why was this important to have uh, this innovation, this uh, evolution to uh, Web 3.0? Uh, pretty much all of you know that machines are pretty stupid comparing to us humans so far, thank God. Um, and they are not that well with context. So, you know, uh, they're, they're pretty much, if you, if you search for Paris, a machine might not know if you're like, looking for Paris Hilton or Paris France. And um, Semantic Web was a solution for that problem. So, basically, in 2006, this simple idea was not realized in any way, and it took so many times, like in 2013, there was a 4 million website, so that's a pretty significant number, that had semantics in them. So, uh, have you guys heard of schema.org website? All right. So, you basically know about microformats and that kind of stuff, so the SEO uh, kind of uh, thing that doesn't, is not like a point of interest for developers too much. But uh, basically, CMS 3.0 uh, kind of did not deliver what Web 3.0 definition implied. And there's a divergence. I'm not saying there's no support at all for the semantic web. Probably, like systems huge such as Sidefinity, Sidecore, and like other multi-million dollar companies have support for those kind of things. They have to, but like smaller, like smallish CMS is still totally disregarded. And um, CMS 3.0 features, as a couple of CMS vendors described them, revolved around other things. So right now we're living in an age of handheld devices and IoT is picking up and whatnot. So we actually need a CMS, like an admin panel, to administrate like um, content that will be served across different devices. So. Um, one of the other features is social media publishing. So there are like specific tools that specialize only in publishing content on social media. And lately, it's uh, either through a third-party integration or as a native feature, it's like becoming the standard feature in CMSs. And integration with other systems is also a big thing uh, because there are so many services out there that you cannot possibly build into a single CMS. So no one was actually addressing the problem of microformats and uh, in my opinion two uh, major features, features that are missing and that are probably not that hard to implement is JSON-LD implementation, which I find much more suitable for uh, displaying semantic data within your source, HTML source, than microdata or RDF formats. So if you guys, RDFA, sorry. So if you guys are not familiar with those, basically they use like the DOM structure where you add like tags and if you want to specify like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, some info about the person, then you'd go and find uh, a div tag that has a person's uh, like picture or phone number, email address, whatnot, and then you'd go through, through, through each of the child elements, and then you'd say, okay, this is a phone number, this is a picture, this is that, this is this. And basically, uh, what the problem is with this approach is that the DOM uh, structure 
does not always mimic the semantic structure that's needed for um, machines to understand what we're actually displaying on the page. So JSON-LD is nothing else but a JSON object that you put on the top of your page, and you provide the semantic data in a purely uh, like machine-readable way. The other thing that uh, Web 3.0 implies is unrestricted access to, the, to, to real data. So what we do when we build websites, we create some sort of relational database that holds the data. And then when we fetch the data, we convert it to an HTML, out, HTML output that we think best serves our website visitors. And we skew it in somehow, or we don't provide uh, the entirety of the data. And it would be so much better for a user if a third party could access the data in its unaltered form. So basically, a way to provide that is having a RESTful API for any of your system, like CMS system modules, that a third party could use and pull the data. So this is something that exists in a way of plugins, but it's far from being like a standard thing. Have you guys heard of Web 4.0? No. Oh. no. <laughs> I will talk a little about that a bit later. But for those of you that never use CMS or uh, might be convinced by my, by my talk that it's time to explore the CMS world and see what's out there, to pick some other tool that you might find interesting, there's this pretty nice tool put together by Sitefinity. It's actually a way for them to gain new customers. So uh, in order to download it, you'd have to fill out a form uh, to get it. And uh, it's basically a list of more than 3, 300 sorry, options that modern CMSs provide today. So I'm pretty sure that if you'd go and check Sitefinity's options, you'd like give it five for each of those. So that's why, that way that they'll, they'll kind of let us know that they're the best. But it's, uh, nevertheless, it's like a great tool if you have time to go through the list to find out what this CMS aims for. So is it uh, good at SEO? Is it good at, I don't know, internationalization and stuff like that? So um, I'd recommend to get this tool. And it's not the only one out there. Other major CMS providers also have their tools. So go check that out if you're, if you're really, really interested in it. Um, so are we kind of getting closer to the Holy Grail CMS idea. So what a Holy Grail might be. So uh, lots of people tend to think it's uh, CMS that does it all. And what I found out in my CMS podcast series is that such a thing does not exist. So uh, actually, it's a myth. And maybe what's like the best CMS for me could not be the best option for you. Or what's best for this project might not be good for the next project. So there's no holy grail CMS. And really, uh, like I've said, uh, you know, depends on who's asking. So there are, as far as I could identify them, for CMS stakeholders. So first we have CMS vendors, the guys that create CMSs. And then we have like partners, as CMS vendors like to call them. So actually, those are most of the time agency owners. And then we have like developers working for the agencies, like solution implementers. And, and in the end, we have clients, sometimes it's only like three persons uh, where we have this freelancer 
uh, that's kind of both agency owner and developer, like one man shop, could be two persons, uh, where a freelancer has his own custom CMS and then he has a client, or it could be you know only one person. If I'm kind of developing developing a product for myself, but whatever way we put it. Uh, what the developer kind of thinks or might think the best CMS solution is, is the one that he knows how to use productively. So if my kind of boss would ask me, uh, so what do you want to use for the next project? I would say probably what I've used for the last one. And please don't make me learn something new because I'm not really interested in it. I'm pretty fine earning my salary like this. But what the best solution for a developer really is, is a CMS system that's mature, so that you don't have to fight someone else's bugs. If you're building a house, you want to build, build it on a firm ground. And something that's well supported by community, if you hit the roadblock, you want to know where to go for help. You need good documentation. That's pretty important for any kind of product, not just CMSs. And that has, like this could probably be the most important thing, built-in features that will speed up the development process of the project at hand. So. Uh, basically, this is going back to what I uh, referred to, uh, to at the beginning of my talk. If you need like 20% more of the time to implement the same set of features with this CMS than with this CMS, then you've kind of stolen 20% of the budget from your client. And a solution that's easily extendable. So you want to cover as many as project requirements with the core CMS features, but some of the things you'd still need to program by yourself, and you need to be able to easily create plugins or to extend it in any other way. What about agency owners? So what do they think? They think that that the most popular CMS solution that's an easy sell is best for them. So let's build the web with WordPress. And <laughs> apparently, this is what's happening. But the best solution for agency owners is actually a CMS that's the one that provides a client with best value for the budget. So this is a question that agency owner needs to answer together with their developers to provide the best um, product to their clients. And of course, agency owners need to keep their developers happy or they're gone. What the client thinks is probably that the CMS that has it all is something that they need. Because, you know, tomorrow I might pivot my product and then I have to pay this agency all over again to do the programming. And probably I'm not aware that that's too expensive. And the best CMS for me as a client is the one that fits project requirements best, feature-wise. We need a solution that's technically well-built using modern technologies. So something that's SEO friendly, that's like the big thing for a client because if the solution ignores SEO, he will get less traffic, earning less money. And accessible. We had to talk about accessibility. This is pretty much disregarded these days. And we need a solution that's, uh, that has a great backend user interface. So uh, we probably want to have a user interface that's responsive so that when I need to make like a quick edit to my page using my mobile, I want to be able to go in and do it like without too much 
fighting the UI. And also, um, some websites have like many editors. So if a UI and UX is too convoluted, uh, my editors will, would you know, probably uh, lose too much time editing pages, meaning that I as a client will have inefficient staff that uh, probably costing me, causing me some uh, financial costs. Um, the CMS that any other development agency can pick up and continue implementing new features. So this is probably really important, though uh, probably in today's programming world, any agency can pick up on anything that's built on uh, either any framework that's really popular or any CMS that's really popular. So still really important, but not that uh, we don't see this problem very often. Of course, if you're using a custom CMS that's poorly built, this might be a problem. So what the CMS vendor guy thinks? So he thinks that best CMS solution is the one that has all the features that he ever needed on client project that he was working at. And in reality, uh, you are not superhuman. If you're just start starting out your own CMS, you're probably a one-man shop and you're you're not able to cover it all. And you need to focus on solving a specific set of problems that your CMS is going to solve. So take, for instance, the static CMS. It's the static slash dynamic, so that's how it got its name, uh, website generator. I don't know how many of you, by the way, are uh, aware of static uh, kind of websites, idea? Not much, so let me briefly explain what was that. So um, it's probably going back to the web 1.0 thing, where you're actually editing your website by editing like uh, a bunch of files on your hard drive. You don't have a database, and then you push your code up, and that's how your site gets updated. So there are like tons of different versions. And Statomic is the one that has the admin panel UI behind it. So that's like the big difference between other static site generators and this one. And uh, some of uh, like front-end user experience is still rendered by PHP, so it's kind of dynamic-ish. So it's, you know, static. But it doesn't have a database, and it solves like a pretty, like a problem of pretty large and significant numbers of client websites where they, all they, they need is like a presentation of their uh, product without too much interaction, and that's what it does, and that's why it's probably popular. And you want to build like really nice documentation for your CMS, and you want to positively engage the community. You want to support the people that support you so that you build a community around your product because tomorrow when it becomes popular, you won't be able to answer all the questions. You want to have like questions answered in Stack Overflow, then, then <laughs> you know you've made it. And that has a great data structure, in my opinion. Um, CMSs that have their own way of storing data in database are causing developers pain. And probably the best uh, like database structure for us as developers is the one that we'd probably create ourselves, so following like the best, best RDB practice. And we need to provide a great UI, as I've mentioned before. So, the web 4.0 thing, this actually does not exist yet. So 
I'm going to go and like uh, tell a story of how it might look. So if we kind of take this venue as an example and consider that in probably near future we're going to have like uh, some way of augmenting our reality. So I might look at any person here in the audience and if you provided your, like, uh, by setting your privacy, you provided me with a way to identify you, that would be like a great thing. And then I'd have like, whenever, wherever I look, I'm gonna be able to see like little clouds and I'll be able to comment on each and every one of them. And I'll be able to project the website that describes this ve venue on this wall here, and I'll be able to, you know, read about it and take the video out, put it over there. I might be uh, even able to go back in time and stay here and look at the concert that happened here like seven days ago. And it will probably be all kind of API integrations and the semantic web and the data would be opened and we should probably be dealing only with whether I, as a venue owner, would allow this information to be publicly displayed when I'm staying in this venue or not. And there would be no actual CMS. The data would be generated or edited when I look at it. You might find me wandering around this room and I would be actually recording a video to my sort of Google Glass thing. And as I'm recording it, I'm actually writing a blog post and you might interrupt me and I say, let me finish this. And by the time I've made the circle, it's published and everyone can see it. So pretty much that could be it, like future is coming. And uh, that's it for my talk. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, show one more thing. Um, before I, uh, is this still on? Yeah. Yep. Uh, before I uh, take any questions, is there time for questions? Um, I don't think so. Okay, good. I'd just like to mention that back in Serbia we have a PHP conference that's happening each year at the last week of May. So if you want to check out the speakers that were on last year, go to this URL. And uh, if you want to download the slides, go to slideshare.net slash my name and you can get them. So that's it. Thanks.